Hey, Clint, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yep, I am finally in, so. Great. <laughs> we can hear you on this end, too. Oh, great. <laughs> Good deal. I, I'm standing in the middle of the room, but I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> the voice from above. <laughs> We're live. Okay. Well, I hear you guys.
Awesome. Um, good afternoon, everybody in person here at Groover Labs and um, our live stream audience on YouTube Live. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I could do that. Um, my name is Tracy Hoover. I'm one of the co-founders here at Groover Labs, um, which is a nonprofit organization. And I would like to welcome you a little more formally to the third installment of our Tech Focus Speaker Series. Um, before I go any farther, um, for those of you who are, who are here in person, if you want a tour afterward, um, uh, Kurt or I would be glad to do that. My other co-founder is my husband, Kurt Gridley, in the back of the room. Um, uh, and so, and for those of you who are online, um, if you want to schedule a tour, come in and uh, do a tour, we'd be happy to accommodate you. We'd love to see you. Um, this afternoon, we are glad to have with us uh, our host, Jason Taves. Jason is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Quick, the revolutionary video captioning service. You may have read about Jason in the Wichita Eagle a few weeks ago. Quick is part of the Wichita Export Accelerator Program. They were also selected to present at this year's South by Southwest, which sadly was canceled, um, among many other things that we all were looking forward to. Um, not only does Jason love technology, but he's also an avid farmer. Jason? Now we play the musical chairs and shuffle around. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, really appreciate that kind introduction. Um, and a huge thank you to you and Kurt um, and everything you're trying to do here at Groover Labs. It's really an incredible space uh, here in downtown Wichita. Um, and the potential is huge, right? The, this is a game changer for technology companies, for startups, for maker spaces and events like this. Um, and I'm so thankful that you've done a wonderful job uh, accommodating for the in-person hybrid uh, with the online events as well. I uh, just want to welcome all of the viewers who are watching this remotely um, and, and those of you who are here in person. Um, excited to have the time to talk and, and share some of what's happening with these Wichita startups. Uh, and we'd like to take a moment today and thank our series sponsor, uh, which is Emprise Bank. Uh, thank you so much for the support today and helping make events like this happen in our own ecosystem. Also, we would like to thank Foreman Law uh, and IdeaTech who are sponsoring today's event. And of course, thank you to KMUW, our media sponsor. Um, and we're gonna actually spend a few minutes here hearing from uh, David Ferguson from Foreman Law. David? Awesome, do I need it? Thank you, Jason. Um, as, uh, as Jason said, my name's David Ferguson. I'm with uh, Foreman Law, which is a, a fairly new law firm here in Wichita. Um, Sam Foreman, who many of the people in the audience and online probably know, has been doing work in the startup community in Wichita since before it was cool, um, so for 10 years or better. Um, he started his own thing in June, and I, I went there the week he opened his doors and said, hey, do you need some help? Um, we have went from two to we're five now. We're probably going to add a sixth in another market here um, by the first of the year. We're all attorneys from larger firms who wanted the opportunity to work more creatively with our clients um, and provide solutions um, that were tailored in large part to startup companies. Um, we work with a lot of scalable startups. We work with a lot of new Main Street type businesses. I personally, about 50% of my practice is, is nonprofit organizations. I'm trained as a tax lawyer. Um, nonprofits often face the same sort of early stage um, hurdles that, that for-profit startup companies face, but, but with an additional layer of complexity that they have to deal with. So, um, we as a firm, one of the ten, you know, kind of pillars of our existence is community service. Um, that's another thing that we think differentiates us from the market. Um, we've uh, huge supporters of the startup, startup ecosystem here in Wichita, obviously, for several years. Um, we've done a ton of stuff with Groover. We love what they're doing here. It's incredible. I can't wait to see what it looks like post-COVID. Um, so we're excited to... Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty ding dang cool right now. So um, once uh, once you're able to do exactly the things you wanted to do and the way you wanted to do them, that'll be exciting. So um, we we were more than happy to help uh, support this effort and and just excited to see that, that folks in Wichita are coming back together to do some cool stuff. So anyhow, with that, I'll I'll pass it back over to Jason here. Thank you so much, David. All right, so now we are going to jump in and hear from today's guests, uh, the minds behind Greenfield Robotics. 
this is something that I'm really excited to hear more about, especially with my background in farming and technology. Uh, there's a lot of cool things that they're doing here. So Greenfield Robotics, um, their main goal is to develop robots uh, and to help farmers uh, reduce the amount of agrochemicals that they're applying to their land. So this is all those nasty things that you're pumping into the ground that plants uh, don't really need. And these robots uh, provide great ways to handle weed control and a few other things. At the same time, they're helping sequester carbon uh, into, uh, into the soil itself. Uh, so carbon farming actually pulls this carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, puts it back into the soil, uh, which in turn helps the crops grow. Uh, Greenfield Robotics co-founder and CEO is Clint Brower. Uh, Clint, a K-State graduate, worked in tech and entertainment in Los Angeles before returning back here to the Wichita area. Uh, he actually runs MG Honor Farms as well as Greenfield Robotics. We also have tonight the VP of Software, uh, which is Steven Gentner, uh, who is also the founder of RoboRealm, a powerful machine vision software application for use in machine vision, image analysis, and image processing. These are really important things when you're trying to steer robots down crop rows. Uh, so Steven graduated from USC where he worked on projects uh, that connected online users to real world um, applications through robotics. Uh, and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. And after we'll, afterwards, we'll talk uh, with them and ask some questions um, from everyone in the audience. So those of you who are here in person and those of you who are online, uh, be thinking of the questions and we'll get to those uh, after Clint and Stephen share. So with that, Clint and Stephen, I'll bring you on. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks very appreciate much. It. Well, we'll uh, Thanks for having us today, and uh, we'll take you through what we've been up to. And uh, we're just going to kind of take you through our background in terms of uh, where we've been, what we're doing, the markets we're addressing, real high level. And then uh, if folks want to ask a lot of detailed questions, that's totally fine. So we'll try to push through this quickly so you can ask the things that you're really interested in. So Greenfield Robotics, basically our goal is to get chemicals out of food. Uh, the secondary benefit of that is we found out along the way that uh, our processes will help remove carbon out of soil, which you mentioned. So just real quick, um, about 20 years ago, when I was farming, you would be able to uh, use basically one chemical, glyphosate, and you could control most of your weeds with that. Um, over time, those weeds have become resistant. And so what's happened is it's not just glyphosate, it's more and more chemicals have been added. And now on average, when we're spraying a crop, we're spraying five to eight different chemicals or at least things that help the chemical work better. And the weeds begin, continue to defeat those chemicals. So dicamba, which they brought basically out of retirement about a few years ago, um, was starting to lose effectiveness just after a few years. And now this past year, it was basically forced off the market in June because of the, the risk that presented to crops. Um, that didn't have genetically modified seeds. There were lawsuits all over the country. The other negative of the way we've been farming is uh, we generate about 30% of the greenhouse gases. There's debate on what the number actually is here, but it's quite a bit. And then the other thing is farmers right now practicing the type of farming we've been, done in the past, um, they're not making a lot of money. And so, and then you see what they're saying about the soil. So soils running off, uh, erosion, issues like that, we're, we're letting carbon escape into the air. And so all these things were based on basically what is called tilled, tilling farming, right? So you used to plow, you disc, and that simply means you turn that soil over and you turn it over until you kill all the weeds, then you plant your crop and you hope that that suppress the weeds and then you start adding the chemicals. And what's happened is about uh, 40 years ago, someone came up with the idea of no-till farming. And that means just what it sounds like. You don't turn over the soil, you don't do any such thing. You just let it sit there and you put your seed in without tilling it, without plowing, without disking, any of these things. And so that's great. How do you control weeds in that situation? And the answer was sprays. And so what happened is, again, we had these sprays that could control things quite well in a no-till farm situation. But those concoctions kept going up and up and up in price and, and their effectiveness um, has been dubious at times. 
So the question is, how do you get off this additive farming process? How do you get out of adding fertilizers? How do you get rid of needing to add all these chemicals all the time to control weeds and to grow your crops? And we call that additive farming. So regenerative farming is the new thing. So if any of you haven't watched the uh, documentary that came out a few weeks ago called Piss the Ground, I'd highly recommend you do that. Uh, regenerative farming basically is described in there at a very high level. But what it does is you're basically getting rid of all the additive, you're getting rid of all the tilling, and you're letting nature do what it does best and uh, working with its plan, essentially. So uh, what we're doing is enabling regenerative ag to scale. And the first spot we start with helps with the weeding problem, but we have multiple bops in development or even prototype phase already at my farm. So these markets, to be honest with you, are understated uh, on this slide. Um, the opportunity is unbelievable um, globally. So it doesn't just apply in the United States, it applies everywhere. So, but it is a massive opportunity. So again, what is regenerative farming? You don't kill, right? Use cover crops. So what, what that means is you plant your corn, you plant your milo, you harvest it, you wheat, and after you're done harvesting, you go and you plant what's called cover crops. And those are things like buckwheat or oats or all kinds of different things that replenish the soil and hold it in place so you don't have erosion. And you essentially put those in place in between those crops and they'll fix nitrogen, they'll add phosphorus, scavenge phosphorus, potassium, make it accessible to your next crop. So that's what cover crops are and then rotational grazing. So now you've got 250 50 million acres in the United States that this applies to broad acre farming. That's just the United States alone. Okay. So rotational grazing right now doesn't really happen on almost any of those because when you're on your corn, soybean, milo, whatever field, there's no fence, right? People took the fence out a long time ago. So how do you do that? You need to be able to graze those crops in a cover crop, as it turns out, is the way that you can graze something you can graze to feed your animals. And so on my farm, we've been testing this for a few years and we graze sheep in the grass fed, no chemical, no vaccine, no nothing, no antibiotics. We haven't lost any from that, from parasites or anything like that. So what have we done? We've created basically out of nothing. We don't have to give them hay. Very often we don't give them any grain. And so our cost of production is really low. So this whole process works together, no till, cover crops, rotational grazing, but there are some things missing to allow it scale. I should know I've been chasing sheep for the better part of uh, two years, which Stephen can attest. I mean, I don't know how many times I've chased him. So uh, it's been a hell of a thing. So, it, was a, it was a nightly activity, <laughs> a very late <laughs> night, nightly activity. <laughs> yeah, nightly. it got to the point like twice a day and we're using the best rotational grazing system supposedly out there. So not a good deal. So. It's not, it can't scale. The cover crops, the fence, none of these systems are working. Uh, I've tried them all. Uh, they just don't work at scale. Um, I've talked, you know, we've got big farms we're involved with on trials. And I asked them, you know, how are you going to keep your one guy who's going from 100 steers to 1,000 grazing during the summer? And I said, how are you going to keep them in with that single line fence if they're next to the highway? And he said, we'll do our best, but we know that some are going to be out at any given time. That's not the life people want to live. So um, there's a lot of problems to be fixed here, but the main one we're going to focus on today is weed control. That's the one where all the chemicals are there and what the issues are and what our first spot was intended to do. So this is what they look like. Um, they've been out in fields uh, all summer. This was the day we actually got them finished. This is uh, on my farm and we, we put them up there for our big picture. But um, we do it as robotics as a service. So we have the farms charges. X, or we charge them rather, um, a set amount per acre, and we reduce the risk. Uh, these bots are only about 140 pounds. A spray rig's 50,000 pounds loaded. So if it rains three inches, which one do you think can get out there and get the job done with weeds? And the weeds that we deal with, when they get a foot tall, they're resistant to almost any kind of spray. So um, you have a real issue. And once they're a foot tall, it's not far before they get three foot tall because they grow about three inches a day and the trunk can get to be about three inches in diameter, which is not much fun to put through your combine. 
So that's that's what they do. So it says around 100 pounds, they're 140. 30 pounds of that are batteries. And so what we're doing is we slide this in with farmers. We don't ask them to change their model. They don't have to do anything different except not spray as much. And so that's the way this works when we start. So we kind of went through all this, but the herbicides, the genetically modified seeds, all these things, all these costs are going up. And their effectiveness is sometimes it works. Most of the time it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the weather. Welcome to farming. So it's uh, a very interesting situation. <clears throat> and I think at the end of the day, you look at it and go, do farmers want to use these chemicals? You know? And the answer is no, they don't. Of course they don't. But right now, it's the most cost effective way to raise the crops. Same thing with consumers. Do you want this stuff sprayed on your food? Of course not. Even if you're someone who doubts, maybe it's not that poisonous, if you're one of those guys, why would you take the risk? There's an alternative. Food's pretty personal. You eat it. So there's really no reason to do this. So that's that's what this company's about. This is what we do. So I'm going to let Stephen take it. I've talked enough so far and let him talk a little bit about the technology that he developed. Yeah, so you kind of get a sense of like the overall size of the machine. You can kind of see Clint there in, in reference to the machine. So these are, are relatively small in terms of fitting in between the rows. And uh, as you mentioned, electrically powered, so there's no smoke or exhaust or anything of that nature. And thanks to battery uh, power getting better and better all the time, it's kind of a problem that gets solved. That's uh, uh, something we don't need to worry about as much. Um, so we want, you know, there's a couple of things we're, we're certainly looking for is uh, speed. So we got to get down the row as quickly as possible. But on the flip side, we also need to be as accurate as possible. Because uh, as one would imagine, uh, if the thing loses control or gets uh, a mind of its own, which it never will, so don't worry, <laughs> there's nothing, nothing of that nature going to happen. Uh, but we want it to go as quickly as possible and as, uh, as fast, as accurate as possible. Uh, and obviously, we want it to last long. So the batteries, there's, a, there's quite a bit of batteries in there to make sure that we can do uh, essentially a full day of running. Uh, so that we don't need to take the robot back and replace batteries that can be actually quite a huge overhead if you're running say a, a relatively large field even the time for the thing to come back is kind of wasted so you want to make sure that it's always out in the field and that it's uh, essentially always uh, cutting and, and essentially doing the job um, now there's a lot of technologies obviously in, involved in getting uh, to do this uh, there's networking. Uh, we always uh, have a pretty good knowledge of what a robot's doing. We can actually see in front of the robot and get a sense of how is it uh, managing with navigation? Did it raise an alert with you know, something maybe like a spade or something or a fence or a tractor or something was left in the field? Obviously, they're, they're not built to uh, navigate around all the various things that you can find in the field. So we want to make sure to uh, have that alert come back and be able to understand that and essentially help it through in a, a more manual sense. But the main point is, you know, create the technology, don't overcreate it, get it out in the fields and get it tested. Because this convergence of kind of ag and technology is always a very tricky one because technology is, is, is typically clean. You, you, you think about you know, lack of dirt, lack of uh, particles that could cause short circuits and all those kinds of things. And then you have agriculture, which is much more you know, literally down to earth and you know, uh, you're dealing with the soil, you're dealing with the outside, you're dealing with pests, you're dealing with plants that are incredibly unpredictable and incredibly random, even though they happen to be in rows uh, within a field. So uh, for me personally, it's always a fascinating thing because there's so many aspects about technology that uh, I've never come across uh, in this particular space. And you know, we were talking a little bit before about seasons. Most technology jobs, you, you really don't care about the season. It could be raining, snowing, hailing outside. You're busy inside in a lab, you know, doing whatever you can continue to work. It's not a problem, right? But in farming, however, you have a huge dependency on the weather. So that actually creates another technological uh, challenge, which is how can you test enough? How can you get enough you know, runtime in to find those little inconsistencies that you, you haven't come across before? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, robotics is interesting, right? Because it's mechanical, electrical, and software engineering combined in completely new ways. And what you do is you multiply all the things that can go wrong very quickly. <laughs> 
And uh, so, you know, what Steven's done here is uh, these these systems, and we'll show a video here at the end, but, um, you know, they use a combination of all sorts of control systems, machine vision being one of them. And uh, so we built these from scratch, and uh, we've, you know, basically done all the programming as well. This is an example of what it looked like at one point. Uh, we got hundreds of these, but uh, this is before the bots. This is after the bots. So this is gives you an idea of how much cleaner the, the field looks after it's done. And they run through here two to five times in a, in a season on soybeans. So we're going to get in there after you plant, and we're going to run up and down the fields now. Um, we have a patent pending uh, on a new system that will get rid of any need for any weed killer at all. This one, you're going to need a little bit to control grass, right? We're cutting them. It's like mowing the lawn. You may not control it. The next one that we've already got prototypes we're working on, we'll eliminate them all. And so we'll have one running on my farm next year. And that's been in the background for three years. We've been working on that. So um, there's a lot going on, but this is what the current one does. This is our team. You met me. You met Steven. Uh, we've got Carl Sutter. Uh, basically, uh, it was me. And it was Steven and Carl. And then we added these other guys. And uh, Carl's background, he worked with Steven at uh, W3 Design, clear back in the day, internet stuff, and they've known each other forever. And Carl, um, the very last picture in here is of his dog when we were first starting to mess around building these things, and you'll, you'll see it, but uh, he's out in California. Carl was uh, really good at just mocking up stuff, low cost. We didn't have any money, right? We started, you, you, where do you start? You start with building stuff and just kind of proving it to yourself. And so Carl was doing that in Long Beach before we wrote any code. And uh, so that was Carl. And then Nundin Kali um, actually runs product now. His title still business development because he was helping me raise money. Uh, but we moved him over to product. And he's back and forth between L.A. and here. Uh, Jay Samets, exec chairman. And uh, Jay, I worked for him at Sony and uh, brought him on board. And he has just been instrumental on uh, helping us just think through a lot of stuff. Um, at the end of the day, you know, he's the most senior of us. And we said, Jay, what do you think? And a lot of times that carries the day in terms of business processes and legal and stuff like that. It's an interesting team because we have an ag background, we have a tech background, entertainment, so on and so forth. And then Alan Bergkamp is, has been advising us. And this is, by the way, the high level team. We have more folks than this. Um, and Alan has been an engineer in the agriculture industry a long time. What Alan does is we say, we can't figure this out. And he comes in and goes mechanically. <laughs> He's light years ahead of us, although we're, we're, we're getting there now. And, um, you know, he says, this is the problem. And this is how you solve it and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of folks like this involved. We've probably got 10 advisors now in, in various capacities across materials, um, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, you name it. So um, really people that are top of their game. So in this area and other areas as well. So we also work with uh, third party firms in Kansas, uh, in Oregon, in California. And uh, so this is this is no light thing uh, to take on. And uh, but it's 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 very exciting when it's not terrifying and it's exciting. So um, but as uh, Jason had said a little earlier, you know, I've been farming for about 10 years. And what the what led up to this was I spent about five years learning how to do it without any chemicals, raising vegetables and stuff like that. And then said, how do we do what I've done with vegetables on a small scale in greenhouses and outdoor? And how do we do that on the big crops? I mentioned 250 million acres. That's corn, soybean, milo, cotton, the United States alone. How do you get those chemicals off that at scale? How do you control weeds without tilling? And so that is that little bot you've seen and the swarm we have, that was where this came from. So it came up with this crazy idea and went and met with Stephen and said, this, this is what I'm thinking. Am I crazy? Could this actually work? And he said, actually, this could work. I get a lot of dumb ideas pitched to me, and uh, but this one actually could work. And so, and they do work. So we'll show you that in a minute. Anyways, that's the high level. That's, that's the way they work. That's Carl's dog early in the process. <laughs> Back there, I'm wondering what in the heck we are working on. So... What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to pull up a video. If you guys give me one second here, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pull up a video and then I'll start sharing again if that works for you. 
Jason, if you got any questions in the interim, you know, that you want us to answer, please do. Yeah, I was just going to thank you, Clint and Stephen, for sharing that high level interview with us because uh, it's, it's incredible to see tech and hardware specifically within tech too, and ag meeting. And Stephen, I know that you said this, uh, you get into very dirty environments and environments where, you know, farmers like me are just trying to get to the, the next day and, and through the end of the day when it comes to managing crops and, and to the next uh, step of that process. And sometimes we're jerry-rigging things together and duct taping and zip tying and welding stuff um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how you guys are approaching um, a lot of problems all coming into uh, one space together. Uh, I'm excited to have questions. I've got a lot, uh, but I also don't want to overpower the, uh, the crowd's questions as well. So uh, Clint, if let you've me, got- uh, <clears throat> Let me show that video. Yeah, is that, uh, can you see it? Okay, yeah. So at the very beginning, you'll see a little bit of the software and then uh, it's only 30 seconds. And then you'll see the bots running in two situations. You'll see them running just a couple days ago uh, alongside my combine while they're helping clean up soybeans pre-harvest. And you'll also see them early in the season on another farmer's uh, irrigated crop of soybeans when the soybeans are still green. Normally when I hit go, it goes. One second, guys. Let's see what we got here. It, it always wants to break on your right when you need it, right? <laughs> yeah. Hold on. It'll pull up. Go ahead. And maybe if you want to open up the your question. Robots, your robots, are they running on Windows or something special? <laughs> <laughs> well, his desktop's running on Windows, <laughs> but our robots. <laughs> there we go. All right. Now we're all right. All right. That was funny. All right. All right. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so there's uh, some of the machine vision working along. Here's a guy managing multiple. So right now it takes about two or three guys to, sorry, it takes one person to run about three bots, keeping an eye on them. That's in the soybeans on the irrigated that I mentioned. I'm going to pause this for one second here. These are soybeans. They're in 30 inch crop rows. These are the bots. They are driving themselves. Uh, the guy you saw earlier would have been sitting in this air conditioned deal and they're monitoring him. So they're monitoring him to make sure they're working correctly, to make sure they're steering correctly, and they're on the edge of field. And so they're watching this, right? That's what they're watching. We built all this software from scratch. And so they're running along here. Now these are soybeans while they were growing during the season. We, we actually did this entire field is about 70 acres. And this was just a few days ago. So we'll, it'll swing around here. Um, but you can see the relative size of the bots <laughs> versus a combine, which is not a big combine, by the way. So, but there they are, and they're, they're running along and cleaning up uh, the weeds that are in there before I combine it. And the interesting thing is on soybeans that you, uh, when you harvest soybeans in particular, your combine, you, you put the header, the thing that you're harvesting with, right on the, on the ground. And so it's really important that you have as many weeds gone as possible. Uh, it's much easier on your machine. So um, that's what they look like. In just high level, we have those machines. We have another one in development uh, that deals with grazing. And then we have another one, as I mentioned, that um, uh, essentially eliminates herbicides, period. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Clint, again. Um, uh, I've, I've got a couple questions that I'll ask and then I'll open it up for everyone here uh, in the in-person audience as well as those who are online. If you drop a comment uh, in this YouTube stream, we'll be able to see that and uh, I'll pass your question along. Uh, so Clint, one of the things uh, as, as a farmer who, as you so eloquently pointed out, the weather is your best friend all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, robots and rain. What happens and what are the advantages of using these little robots versus bigger things? Yeah, I think uh, it's twofold. Uh, one, the weight of them, they're 140 pounds. Last last spring, um, we went out the last spring, spring before actually, we went out there and we had 13 inches of rain in April and we were out there every day and we didn't get stuck. Now that was on no-till ground, which is my other point. 
these enable everyone to go no till. The reason a lot of farmers still till is uh, they've been doing it for a long time. It's equipment they have, inertia. That won't go forever. A lot of them are going to retire. And the second reason is they don't like using all those chemicals. And so um, once we provide this solution, more and more guys will go to no-till because you reduce that uh, issue. The thing with no-till is this. You store five times the amount of rainwater per cubic foot of soil. However, which doesn't seem logical, but you can get on the soil much faster with your equipment when you're no-till. And so it's created a lot of soil structure in there and it supports equipment a lot better. So not only does it benefit us getting out there, it benefits your other equipment uh, being able to get out there. So um, your rain is a, is a big deal. That five, you know, 5X increase in rainfall storage is a huge deal when you're like we are right now, right? And how dry it's gotten around here, all the dust, all the issues we're having. I have no-till Milo. It's still doing pretty well. Is this still able to access all that water that's out there? Um, wouldn't have been possible on, I can tell you on clay soil, they'd be dead as a doornail, <laughs> but still plowing and, and disking. So it's, it, it really is the way to go. Excellent. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I know we have a microphone that we can pass around. We'll start over uh, here and, and work our way around. Want to start here? Okay. Okay. I'll get y'all. Hello. Uh, my question, Con is concerning the guidance on the robots. Uh, are you tying that into the field mapping from the fields to begin with, or is it purely just uh, visualize on the robots themselves? And, and secondarily, how are they telling the plant from the weed? You want to try it? Go ahead, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can barely really take that. I talked enough. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, a great question. Um, it would probably, you know, certainly take a couple of days to kind of go through all the different modes. And, and we were constantly looking at uh, adding additional ways to, to kind of get down a field because obviously a field changes throughout the season. And so what, we, what we've been focused on for the most part is a visual recognition of rows. And we don't actually recognize the individual plant because we don't care so much about the individual plant. What we care about is steering a mechanical cutting system down the middle of the row. So when you look at it from that point of view, really in a very crude way, you can kind of say, just stay in between the two green things and progress down the you know row looking for the brown stuff. And as long as that kind of matches, then you're in a good situation, right? Uh, but obviously that, that doesn't always apply. Right, so there are obviously many fields that are green, and, and, and you know you can you can certainly run that, but then there are many fields that are not, or, or have maybe a uh, a lot of gaps in between them where you can't necessarily tell how rows join together. So then what you do is you uh, look at other techniques like uh, GPS based systems. So with a combination of techniques, you can get through a field in a much more robust manner rather than necessarily relying on one technique. And it's the same thing that we kind of found uh, doing things manually. So just to back up a little bit, uh, when we first built the robots, they were uh, tested using remote control. So just like you have your RC car that you buy from you know, whatever store and, and have your kids play with, that's essentially was the first control, uh, control structure of these machines because a lot of this is R&D, right? Robotics is just all full of R&D. You can never say, well, we're gonna build this, it's going to be perfect, and it will go down the road with no problems whatsoever. Yeah, if you believe that, uh, you're in a different world. I'd love to talk with you, but... <laughs> so what you do is you test, you build a concept, you understand the problem, you do some research, you build a prototype, and then you test. And so you send it out in the field, but you don't test necessarily with autonomy. So what we did was we had these remote control vehicles that we would have people follow behind them and RC them down the road. The theory being, uh, if they cannot accomplish the task, given the massive you know, brain power of a person in comparison to say a machine, then we have a problem. And we, need, we, we know we need to in some way remedy it to fix it for at least a human to be able to do it. Um, so in that case, we very quickly determined that, well, you can have really big gaps in a row 
And even the person's not quite sure where the next row actually starts. Like, how do I leave one row and walk perfectly straight into the next row such that I actually accomplish and take care of the entire field? Um, and you also get an appreciation for all the obstacles, uh, you know, uh, foxholes or, you know, various uh, machinery left in the field, et cetera, et cetera. It happens on all farms. It's, you know, it's one of those things. And in fact, what you want to do is you want to test on the worst possible case. Because if you go to a farm and it's pristine and it's beautiful and there's nothing wrong with it, and every crop and every row is just absolutely perfect, that's a fantasy land, right? That that, that really exists. So so do your do get get something to do your worst tests in because that'll give you the most uh, insight as to uh, to what you need to build. So after the remote control stuff, we're we're learning the engineers who aren't necessarily uh, farmers. You 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 start to learn the terminology to begin with. There's a there's a little bit of uh, back and, and throw, right? The farmer learns the technology speak, and the technologists learn the the farmer speak. So it's good to uh, to know and understand your domain and industry that you're in. Um, so once we've done the RC things, then we say, okay, let's control these remotely from a single camera. The single, single camera is mounted on the robot looking down at the rows. And uh, we refer to that as teleops, a teleoperated uh, machine. And the same thing applied. Uh, can you, as a human, use a single camera to steer these robots in a controlled way, that's a key phrase, <laughs> controlled <laughs> way down, uh, down a row? And uh, how does that feel? Uh, how do, uh, what mistakes do you make? Uh, what additional things do you need, say, in the software and the interface in order to make this a much easier task, right? And then, oh, by the way, can you do it on two robots at the same time, right? Is that even, even possible or not? And so through that process, then we arrive finally at autonomy, saying, okay, now we have a machine out on the field that can run down a row. It has sensors and it has a camera and it has telemetry information that's coming back to a central location. Uh, can we use those sensors and automate, in essence, the process uh, of going down the road? And we have several solutions that will work to do that, given various crop uh, types. But if you ask me the same question in another 50 years, uh, we will have more, but not all. So you can spend an entire lifetime looking at different ways to uh, simply steer a robot down the field and to get it to do a better and better and better and better job. And that's the key with robotics is you do that iteration because it's such a complicated prototyping, testing, review, learning, back to prototyping, testing, review, learning. So it's an iterative cycle that keeps going and going and going. But the, the net result is the product, the thing that you're developing becomes better and better and better at, at, at what it's doing. And Stephen, we, we had a question from one of our online viewers. I think that might be a, a quick, easy answer uh, relating to how we're how you guys are navigating down the rows. Um, does there have to be a specific pattern of the rows? What happens when you have curvy or hilly fields? Um, talk to us a little bit uh, briefly about that, and then we've got some more questions here in person. Sure. So well, everything to do with vision is about context. How do, how do, what am I looking at? How can I, what, what assumptions can I make? And so we assume the robots in 30-inch rows uh, and visible, able to see uh, several at a time and that there is perspective within the image because perspective, you, you get that when you have depth, right? And so those are the kinds of things that we uh, uh, make and assume. So if you took it out and put it onto a very different field with much wider rows, the vision system would have a lot of problem because it says, I expect to see things where I expect to see them. I expect the field model to be mapping with what I understand it to. I expect that rows will more or less be straight. They don't need to be perfectly straight. They can undulate a little bit, with, you know, such as around a telephone pole or you know something like that. Uh, but if they suddenly veer off and go at a 90 degree angle, we consider that an end row, right? Because fields rarely make a make a 90 degree turn in the middle. Uh, so with those assumptions, you you can reduce the amount of computing that you do and you can increase the stability and the reliability of the system. But you have to understand the context of the environment that you're in. And the way we do that with vision is we take a lot of images and then we sit 
you know, and review them, go through them, put them through the cycle. Does the system understand what we're looking at? If it doesn't, how can we improve it? Iterate, 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 and then test essentially on uh, on live machines. So irrigation circles are likely a little further down the track. Well, I mean, irrigation circles, we can definitely go through. That's not a problem. Uh, if we are planning to follow a circular field, which I haven't seen one, but I, I guess you yeah. could actually find it in a circle, right? Yeah. That would actually be easier uh, than a straight field, believe it or not. And it has to do with the geometry of a circle is actually easier to determine and more unique in nature than a straight line is. There's a lot more straight li uh, lines than there are curves. So uh, ironically, it seems like a harder problem, but uh, it in fact isn't. Uh, now, the the dips in the uh, the pivot tracks or so, you know, that that if it's really really deep, then you have more of a you know mechanical situation where if you have a gully or something running through the middle of your field, we have to know that that actually exists. So we will drone scan the field initially to look for hazards that, you know, are either something we didn't anticipate or something that the uh, the machine can just physically not do. And then we, you know, annotate that to say, you stay out of these zones. Don't, don't go in this area because it's not something that uh, we believe that the uh, machine can do autonomously. And then we can always fall back on uh, an R uh, teleop based system or even an RC based system if, uh, if necessary. Having these multiple levels of control structure was, was actually not necessarily planned, but it came out as a, a huge advantage uh, in these kinds of systems. So if you're building complex architectures, have simpler and simpler layers, because number one, it helps with debugging, because if you know one layer is working and another is not, then you kind of know, you know where in the software, where in the sensor stack essentially do I need to look. Uh, and it also makes life a, a heck of a lot easier in terms of just in the case of robotics, just moving and manipulating these machines around. Excellent. Well, sure. Let me add one thing here quick. Okay. If you, don't mind. Uh, you know, so we're following 30 inch rows right now. That's what we're working in. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is uh, we did build one that could deal with 15 inch rows. But, um, you know, while we're learning, uh, the bigger the form factor, the better for electronics and wiring, <laughs> having your hands in there and motors and, and that. So, a lot of farms are going to 15 inch rows, especially the further up north you go for this very problem with the uh, weeds is, is one of the benefits and reasons. Of course, wheat and, and oats and barley, these things are planted at seven or seven and a half inch rows. And in fact, once in a while, I'll see you guys do that with soybeans. So we're not worried about that use case yet. I mean, we, we certainly have a plan for it, but we're taking advantage. You know, all the stuff Stephen was describing is you know, we're assuming that the field is structured. Right. And so we're not a Roomba. And so that's one of the reasons we thought this could work is, is uh, you know, you have a structured environment. So we're not trying to do really hard things that some other people have been trying to do and kind of some are and some aren't with very success of trying to read every single plant. It's not that we couldn't figure that out and do that. It's just we don't want to be here for the next six years trying to perfect that. We want to get out there and have an impact. And we've all been in technology a long time, Stephen and myself, and I've never seen a project that took you 10 years to be a successful company. So we wanted to get out there and start having revenue, which we do have this year, a small amount, but we do. And next year we'll have quite a bit. So um, that's that's kind of our approach. Get out there and learn and you get those reps. Um, that's the most important thing. Get out there and learn. Yep. Absolutely. We've got a question here in person. Yeah. So I'm curious about reactions and sentiments you may have gotten and if you have yet from equipment makers such as John Deere or chemical companies because as you start to scale up and be successful, they might perceive you as a very serious threat. And so they might want to buy you or squash you. And I'm just curious what kind of reactions there may have been, if any, so far. None we're aware of. I mean, um, we'll see how, how it all works out. I have, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think that uh, what we'll see eventually is guys, some guys are going to try to mimic what we're doing. I, I would anticipate that. In the chemical firms, I mean, who knows um, what they're going to do or, or, or try to do at this point, you know. Um, hopefully they'd want a partner, but uh, we'll see what happens. We do We do have another question online as we're getting uh, the mic passed around here. Um, was there a uh, any kind of legal or like regulatory roadblock, uh, OSHA roadblocks for having these robots in the field 
Do they need a supervisor? Where, where's the technology? Where's kind of this monitoring going uh, as related to ag tech? Couple of things on that. One is uh, we have about five different control methods on this thing. The last one being run up to the thing and hit the big red button. <laughs> <laughs> Always have a red, big red button. <laughs> so um, it, it's interesting though. I mean, uh, the, just to directly answer that question, none yet. Uh, but we're pretty, I think we feel pretty good about that because one, we have all these ways to shut them down and two, they're 140 pounds and, um, you know, they're not going to do that much damage. Um, really, I mean, they might damage some crops, but, uh, they're not going to kill anyone. Right. Yeah. Versus a 50,000 pound spray rig. If you tried to make that uh, run remote and it got loose, uh, you'd have some problems. So, um, we'll see how that all works out. I'm sure the further we develop, you know, some folks will um try to bring that up but um it's it's certainly some look they've been in my field we have to keep them controlled so each time we've you know early on when we had a few uh runaways of sorts then you learn from that and you program and again that's why you get out there and you get those reps done so you can prove that absolutely here in the back in person yeah maybe just a few questions about your commercial model on your powerpoint initially you had like robots as a service so um, do you have like supervisory software? Is the intention that this is eventually done by the customer or dealer that monitors the fleet through some overall software? Uh, and then maybe some specific things you said, uh, you're basically steering the robot down the rows with a camera and it's a, a cutter bar. Is that on all the time? Is it on when you sense weeds? And maybe the last one was uh, docking is a pretty manual process and an intensive process. Have you looked at like, do you, are you far enough along to have like docking stations, automatic docking for charging? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just even interrupt me anytime you want. Mm -hmm. I think on the, I'm, I'll start with the easy one. The docking station, we're not that far along. <laughs> and uh, right now we, we swap the batteries, but they take uh, a matter of seconds uh, to swap them out. So, um, and they run for about eight hours uh, right now on average out in fields with those batteries. So we only need to do it once a day. Um, so, so that, that is one, um, are the cutters running all the time and whatnot? Uh, currently they do, um, you know, if we wanted to get into more sensing and this where Stephen could jump in that, you know, more we run them or not run them, um, then yeah, we would shut them off. But remember it takes energy to spin those suckers back up in the, in the first place. And now I've forgotten what your first question was, which was the, uh, the commercial model robots as a service. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the one that I'm, I'm most well suited to answer. Um, the, uh, <laughs> That's right mine. That's an easy job. You know? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. No. I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, yeah. The commercial model, the robotics as a service. What we're doing here, guys, is uh, we're trying to fit inside uh, the way farming's already done. So if you look at the way a farmer works right now, they go into the fall and they say, OK, what am I going to grow next year? I'm going to go ahead in a lot of cases, buy my seed, and my chemicals for the following year in the fall or in the winter. And sometimes they'll get discounts and stuff like that for those early orders. So they're already making their plans. They're already spending their, their funds. They already know so on and so forth what they're going to do. And so they take out an operating note in many instances, almost all instances, um, farms have operating notes you know, from the bank. And so we make sure that we just fit into that, that you don't have to explain to your banker like, well, I'm going to spend more money on these guys or less or different or it's a weird thing. We just do it a per acre fee and it's a fixed fee. And we take that risk if how many times we're going to have to be out there in that field. We don't ask the farmer have to think about it. So I guess you could use, you know, it, it tries to be turnkey. Um, and, uh, and then we do monitor the, the fields for them using drone and uh, seeing where they're at or just simply driving by, see how the field's doing in the early stage. Um, so as we scale that, we'll see exactly how that model works out, but we'll have a pretty good idea the more we do this, how fast those weeds are coming back given various conditions. There'll be a whole data thing on the back end here. So that's the way it works. And farmers so far have felt great about it because we're at the low end of their range of what they use on the sprays. Yeah, I mean, I, I can also sort of chime in. There is actually a technology 
you know, preference for this kind of model as well. And if, if any of you guys in, in Grover Labs or so are, are sort of looking at this, uh, one of the questions is, well, how do I get really complicated technology out to my customers as quickly as possible? And the as a service model is a great way to do that because what you do is you can get real world experience, but you're still responsible for making sure that the operations run smoothly. So what it actually does is it allows you to innovate a lot faster because what you're doing is you say, I'm going to make an improvement here. And if that goes wrong, I'm going to suffer as a company, uh, uh, you know, essentially putting that out uh, to a field. So it's in your self-interest to improve on the, uh, the product itself because you become more efficient, you, the margins increase, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also push out innovation a lot more without having to worry about customer support. So never forget the relationship between a company and a customer can be soured very, very quickly by a bad product or a product that will be brilliant but might not be to the point where the farmer or your customer sees the advantage at that point. So be very cautious about that relationship and you, you want to at least control it and try to maintain it as much as possible in the early years before. You will lose control of that eventually, there's no question, but uh, at least at the beginning you can try to mitigate that and also allow for innovation to happen at a much faster rate. Yeah, right now we want to, uh, to summarize I'm the I'm the main farmer in the early stages um, until you know part of the way through this year. That was the one that when I'm combining the crops go. Oh my god, <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> so um, so but we're in pretty fast that stage now. So you know, but it's still as a service. You know, is what we want to do, and we don't want to oversell. You know. Well, I want to be conscious of your guys' time. So I, I know that we have a few questions uh, here in the in the YouTube uh, video. Uh, maybe if you have time in the next week or so, you can come and ask those. I want to get one more in-person question in uh, as we wrap this up. Um, and and we'll go ahead with that one now. So we, I may have a few more minutes. I thought my obligation, I, I might have okay. more time. Okay. Minutes. Well, we'll keep going and uh, I'll let you give me a secret nod or something. <laughs> when you're done. I'll just go. I got to go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a lot about the importance of this product for reducing chemicals, but there's also the importance of like considering costs. So how does it compare to um, cost wise to other solutions? Yeah, the idea is that uh, the costs that we uh, are at right now are basically a replacement costs, but actually cut your risk down. And in some cases, uh, much lower if you have a high risk year. And by high risk year, I mean, if you have to spray multiple times as the uh, crops are growing. Now, um, so that's, you know, and we're, we're, we're focused on conventional. Everyone always thinks we're organic. We're not. We're not focused on organic. We're, we're focused on conventional mar uh, markets at this point. So the costs are, are are really just a substitute or even lower. We're not going to have people adopt technology just for the sake of it. There you go. Well, and Clint, I know as as you guys are are looking at this per acre cost, right? When you're replacing uh, the chemicals that are generally generally being um, applied, um, are you? Are you taking care of just the herbicide component of it, or are you pesticide as well to some degree? Yeah, so we're focused on herbicides right now with this first product and, and another one that's in development. So, um, but we are focusing, uh, we are, as far as spraying for insects, insecticides, right now we're not doing anything on that, um, at right. least that we talk about. So, um, you know, that is still left to, uh, you know, a spray rig if you need it. But one of the interesting things about regenerative agriculture, and I'm seeing this on my own farm, is um, when you are constantly rotating crops and you're using cover crops and so on and so forth, you actually see your pest pre uh, pressure go down. Now, it's not absolute. Right? You can get what's called sugar cane aphids a mile and they come up from Texas. I don't care how much rotation you've been doing, they're going to show up if they want to show up. <laughs> But uh, on a lot of things that are just pests that are around here all the time, you you build up those alternative ones. So, so you know, I'm not saying you won't need to spray. You will once in a while, uh, but uh, we don't we don't deal with that. So now we're focused on weeds. Excellent. 
over here in person. So when, when I raised my hand, uh, my question was actually around the economics as well for the farmer. Uh, obviously, longer term, that would be better, I would assume. But but my other question, I think I know the answer. Will this have any sort of impact on, on the protein or yield theoretically down the road? Or are we looking at the same crop as a finished product? I think the current weed bot probably doesn't have much impact at all unless you know unless the herbicides have some impact on that right where we would have a, a benefit there but I don't have any numbers or science or anything to indicate that um, but one thing I will say is over time with regenerative ag um, those principles again that were kind of the those stepping stones to get there um, because of the no-till component to start with and it uh, it is proven pretty much at this point that uh, your nutrient density and if you follow the principles uh, increase on crops. So the value of the crop will follow to increase at that point as well. Excellent. And let me add to that, actually. I actually have a deal with uh, Canada Pet Foods. Uh, um, and so we've had that for a few years. And uh, here, I'll just show them. Actually, I have a picture of them. This came up. So this was years ago, but uh, they're out at my farm here. Can you see that? Yep. So that was their uh, international and national sales team. Okay. And uh, so Canada is a pet food company. And uh, so we have a supply chain. So for example, we have guys farming in Nebraska right now. We have peas um, shipping down there that I sourced and work with them. And they're using uh, no-till methods and, and some regenerative methods. They're not using broad spectrum pest sprays, so on and so forth. And they get a premium for that crop. And uh, so, um, so we are already doing it. I've been doing this for, I mean, year five. So, um, and we, so we have farm, farms here and there and places that we're growing at all kinds of crops. So, so we know that's there. Um, one of the challenges for getting a premium, I'm going a little past your question, but one of the challenges for a premium crop, right, is how do you get benefits? And if you look at the big ag companies, one of the challenges for them is, uh, or, or food companies for that, really, um, how do you carry that value, that additional value through your existing supply chain? And that makes it very difficult and unwieldy to, to find that market. And so that's why, you know, I did the Canada deal years ago because it, it, it enabled me to figure out what those markets look like, how they function, where the margins are. And uh, we figured it out. And by the way, it saves Canada money. Excellent. So if you had an infinite growing season right now, Clint and Stephen, uh, what would be the next set of challenges that you'd be solving over the next six months? Well, <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> uh, let's see. No I mean, it's, it's from from a, I'll, I can speak from a technology standpoint. It's probably a little bit easier in terms of like you know, uh, we we it, it's a lot more obvious like where are you going, what what you need to do. So the uh, uh, the rule with robotics is um, very similar to the eighty twenty rule which you know you can do a really simple thing and you can get 80% but the last 20% takes you forever to do. So that's kind of, you know, uh, that's always ongoing as I had mentioned before design and rate repeat kind of thing. So in this case, um, there's a lot of edge case uh, situations, uh, circumstances that come up that uh, we might not expect necessarily within uh, a field. It is a constrained environment but it's not perfectly constrained, right? And so certainly from the technology standpoint we want to keep these things running and we want to increase the speed and we want to increase the accuracy while that speed increases, or at least maintain the accuracy while the speed increases. So that's the majority of the uh, essentially research that is done is we're in a difficult situation. Can we create an automated way to uh, uh, get out of a problem, to move around the situation, to continue on without necessarily having to uh, either stop the robot and then ask an operator or a, a monitor to sort of come in and say, hey, I got a problem here, can you can you kind of resolve it? So it's, it's just really increasing the autonomy and there's, you'll never get to 100% of the cases, but you can certainly make more and more of a dent and that improves the overall efficiency and benefit to, uh, to the company. And uh, just to add, that we have two other products in development. So one prototype's already been out there for two months, and we haven't really talked about it, and probably won't too much today. And then the uh, the other one will have our first prototype in fields by uh, meaning real full on. We've had kind of minor versions uh, in fields in April, May. So and in fact, we are we are developing in Florida this winter. So it's a it's a good question. 
There you go. Well, it's it's nice to have growing seasons that extend beyond what we have here in Kansas, right? Well, it's pretty warm for October, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple other questions that we had here online, then I'll I'll do a, a last pass here in person. Um, I think I know the que the answer to this, uh, but Rena asks online: uh, Are you guys using machine learning currently, Stephen? Um, we do use a form of it, um, but it may not be necessarily in the typical way of what you consider to be machine learning. This isn't necessarily AI. Uh, we're also not doing a huge statistical, you know, kind of analysis, uh, but there are machine learning techniques that we use in essence to better tune uh, the robot, so. Excellent. Um, and I think the other one that we had, uh, we already answered uh, kind of a, along the, the cost associated with keeping an acre of uh, ground clean for a season. Uh, Clint, I think you said it was, it was close to the replacement of, of what uh, this phrase would be right now. Yeah, nobody's argued with us on it. And uh, I think that the uh, interesting thing about this is, uh, again, I'm doing it on my farm. So I'm running two or three years ahead of, of what we're talking about here, at least. And uh, the margins are increasing all the time. So um, I honestly think we'll end up at a point with the tools we're developing right now right. that uh, cut your costs um, considerably and um, increase your revenue big time as well. Awesome. Well, we'd like to hear that in farming, right? I mean, there's not too many opportunities yeah. that we get to say that. I mean, the bar is pretty darn low right now. So <laughs> uh, I think we got a question here from Kurt. Yeah. Hey, Clint and Steven. It's good to see you guys uh, live and well. Uh, I first met Clint and Steven, and I think Jason was part of a group uh, informal discussion a couple years ago before we had even had ideas of Gruber Lab. So uh, we're still around and you guys have made great progress on all the things you said you were going to do. So that's exciting. Um, the question I have, because I don't ever remember asking you this before, but your approach of using a swarm uh, of small robots as opposed to my impression, other, uh, especially larger ag manufacturers that are experimenting with this are following the more traditional large uh, implement. And I wondered, you know, what was your thinking on that? Is that a long-term advantage or is that sort of ease of development? Uh, what's your thinking on that? Thanks. You know, I think it's, um, first off, you know, it'll be on a case by case basis is what we develop. And so um, this first one is, is definitely better off for the problem we were trying to solve for to be a small bot. It's got to fit between the rows um, with what it's doing. Um, now, we may end up with some other form factors on some other things we're doing that look nothing like. In fact, I can guarantee you the one we're developing that's out in the field right now looks nothing like this. So uh, I think it'll vary based on what we're trying to do. However, um, the trend, if you can get it done with lighter equipment, you're better. Uh, Ohio State University has come out and said, just from grain carts alone, you can lose 30% of your yield the following year from where the grain carts ran in the field. So compaction is a really big deal um, from large equipment when you're running around out there doing it. And so, and then the other thing is accessibility. Can you get the job done? And as things continue to degrade a little bit with the climate or change, it, um, you're looking at, can you get out there and get it done? So, and we can with small machines. And so anything we build will always be tailored to almost regardless of conditions can we get out there. And that's yeah. the opposite of what ag equipment manufacturers have done where they're saying, I have an operator, I gotta make it as big as possible so that one person can be as efficient as possible. We think that we're going to, you don't need an operator, you need a manager. And so our goal is to allow farmers to be better managers and not that they're not already incredibly astute managers they are i don't know many other managers who battle the things that farmers do and all the variables it's incredibly multivariable um, but, but if we gave them better tools to work with uh, including the bots on the ground then i think they could um, frankly enjoy their job a lot more and if i can add sort of two points uh, to that uh, uh, scalability and redundancy right so the scale you can scale down and you can scale up uh, but just simply by adding machines essentially to the field. So that's, uh, you can be incredibly flexible in terms of, okay, we need to get this job done quicker or, you know, this one just uh, can kind of take its time and, you know, work with, with fewer machines. And then the second point is then redundancy, which is something that, you know, I've learned to appreciate farmers really know a lot about because <laughs> things break a lot. 
And so having uh, machines, you know, and even they can be unintended, you know, the uh, a machine might go over, you know, into a riverbank or something and essentially get destroyed or something. Um, there are many cases where you have hardware problems, hardware errors. In our case, it doesn't matter as much. One's down, the rest keep going. We add another one uh, or not, and the other ones pick up the slack essentially. So what you're looking at is a much, much more robust system in terms of like, okay, we're on the field, we're moving. We might, you know, in a worst case scenario, you lose the machine, but you can always either add more or et cetera, et cetera. So that model has a lot of effectiveness uh, in, in this kind of unknown environment where, you know, you have down from the hardware system to sensors to software so that, that all need to work perfectly in order to, uh, to run correctly. And it's an environment that is very uh, abrasive to technology. <laughs> I want to I want to add one thing, uh, Kurt. When we met, uh, you know, you were telling me what Groover Labs is going to be, and I was having a hard time visualizing it. But uh, I've seen that I've done all the stuff online and stuff. It looks really cool. So, congrats on that. Because I remember you had all this equipment in this room, and you're describing <laughs> it to me. So, congrats to you, and Tracy, on uh, building this out. Yeah, it's it's really impressive to see what they've uh, created and built here, and uh, uh, we look forward to. Uh, even even seeing one of the old prototypes come back, and we could maybe do some RC races around in the courtyard, right? <laughs> so we Steven, can mow the grass. With your, sorry, go ahead. Oh, we can mow the grass with your old prototypes. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I bought a new lawnmower for the farm this summer, and I was like, this is probably really stupid. Why am I doing this? But uh, whatever. <laughs> Well, guys, I have so many questions that I would love uh, to continue um, asking you. And Clint, I know selfishly, uh, I've got some time on your calendar in the future to uh, follow up on a few of those. Um, the last one that I wanted to ask um, kind of relates to um, the, the swarm approach that Kurt was talking about. Um, you mentioned that you could cover um, 100 acres with a swarm. What, what does a swarm size look like? And uh, how, how many robots does that uh, include? And as I, as I understand, since you're providing this as more or less robots as a service on a per acre cost, your team is coming in and facilitating that, um, that actual management of the, the, the cropland. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So the goal is 10 acres per bot per day. Excellent. And so day can mean a lot of things, but um, that's, that's, that's the goal. We couldn't quite hit that right now. Right. Uh, we couldn't. Um, but uh, I think by end of year, we'll be a lot closer. Um, Software-wise, we're in pretty good shape. Hardware, we just keep learning. Um, but uh, the team right now goes on, and I kind of mentioned this quickly, but uh, right now, one person can keep an eye on about three bots and, uh, you know, corrects for some errors and stuff like that. And, and, and a lot of times, it's mechanical errors, errors that lead to something going wrong. And so, um, you know, and again, that was our approach, as, as you know, Jason, what it's like raising money. You uh, you start with the lower cost stuff to go out there and, and uh, prove your concept. And so we're past proving concept. Now we're commercializing them. And so now we're putting commercial components in. And we've got guys that have been engineering for 30 years advising us from here to the moon. We've got automaker parts companies. We've got ag part companies. We've got, you know, China, Germany, U.S. We're trying to focus on Germany and the U.S. and, and basically non-China, but adding parts uh, that we know won't break. Right. What are those um, what are those cycles? How many cycles can it go without breaking this type of engineering? So, you know, we're not quite at the aerospace level, you know, but uh, we're 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 improving quite a bit. Well, I know there's going to be a lot of farmers who want to follow up on this conversation. What's the best way to get a hold of you guys uh, in terms of connecting, whether they're interested in deploying some of these bots in the swarm on their farm next year or even in the future? Um, and uh, what's what's that best path to get to you, Clint? Steven? Steven's home address is... <laughs> <You know, but. laughs> no, uh, just email me. Uh, we don't let Steven out much, so he's available. <laughs> I know, I haven't been so, out. Uh, it's <laughs> it's uh, Clint, C-L-I-N-T, dot Brower, B-R-A-U-E-R. Uh, at greenfieldrobotics.com. Just shoot me a note. Um, might be a day or two sometimes to get back to you, but I will. And um, I'm going to put something else out there. We are hiring two people. And uh, one is a mechanical engineer and the other one is software engineer. And um, 
the mechanical engineer, we're looking for someone who can come in and has done it for 10 years and know how to do it. Yeah, I don't care if you're in robotics, but it's more mechanical. And then software is someone to, the, to help with Steven, you know, pretty high capacity software engineer to work with him. So I just want to put it out. We're going to look in Wichita first and uh, hopefully you can find folks here. If not, we'll try to import them or, you know, from around the area. Excellent. Well, you guys heard it here first. If you want a job at uh, Cutting Ag Tech Greenfield Robotics, um, reach out to Clint and Steven and they can get you hooked up. Well, thank you so much, guys. I uh, really appreciate the time. I'm um, really looking forward to seeing how you transform the industry. Um, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. And I'll tell you what, my 11-year-old self out there hoeing shatter cane would have <laughs> filled for version one of RC mowing machine. Uh, driving down the soybean rows. So I appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate Good it. Good luck. <laughs> Bye -bye. For, for everyone else who's uh, online um, and around, I uh, just want to thank you uh, and the amazing crew here at Groover Labs uh, for putting on this event and making this possible. Um, it's great to connect with some of these Wichita startups uh, like Greenfield Robotics. Um, but also hear, you know, what's happening around the country and, and, and around, um, you know, this Midwest area as well to see what is what is interesting and these intersections of very complex and, and hard problems to solve. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, personally Kurt and Tracy uh, just for putting this on and making a space here in Wichita available. Um, because these tech talks, uh, which we're all looking forward to uh, in a time of COVID, having an opportunity to connect online or even in person, um, it's, it's also great to have a community around uh, stuff like this. So I'm excited to hear more. If you have any interesting ideas that you think would be cool to see on this Groover Labs uh, tech talk stage, uh, please reach out to the Groover Labs team. Uh, that's something they're always uh, keeping an ear out for. Um, speaking of events, don't forget to book your tickets for the next one, right? I mean, we're supposed to say that. Yeah. Yes, um, that uh, links for that will go out sometime in the next week or so. But I want to thank Jason for emceeing tonight, this afternoon. That was really awesome. Um, and thank you all for coming. I think, that, I think, I that's, think that's it. it. That's a wrap, right? <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys next time.